The Witch in the Wood by T.H. White, Chapter 14. The winter came to Lothane, and with it a letter from King Lot. Dear Morgoth, he wrote, please send me six changes of underclothes, the winter ones. You had better get Alice to attend to it, as you are bound to send the wrong kind. The war is not going very well at present, and this Arthur youth is being helped by a magician called Merlin. I do not know what war is coming to. Obviously, the fellow has no, is no sportsman. However, we have 4,500 horse and 800 foot, and Arthur has only 20,000 that we know of altogether, so he can't last much longer. Also, he has absolutely no idea of the rules of the game. It is always the same with these upstarts. No idea of etiquette, of etiquette and can't tilt with a straight line. All Boz sends his love. Send a dozen handkerchiefs with the bests. Anguish of Ireland has got a cold and is giving it to all of us. I can't think why he doesn't stay in his tent. He's very selfish. Now I must stop as I am going out for an ex out to an execution. Don't send the summer ones. Yours affectionately, Lot R. Queen Morgoth thoughtfully dropped the letter into the fire without troubling about the underclothes and glanced out of the window. It is said to be difficult to know what is going on in a, in a great lady's mind, and in the case of Queen Morgoth, it was doubly so. This is not to say that the witch was stupid. On the contrary, when she was in one of her blue stocking transubstantiations, she could quote Chaucer, Chaucer and Gower and Henryson and Langland by the ream. Then again, when she was in a religious role, she could soliloquize about St. Columbus Columba and bear herself in the most modest of ways. Sometimes, when she was just being a bonny Scottish lass, she could dance reels as gracefully as the best. And if she was in a highbrow part, there was nobody in the Twelve Kingdoms who could keep up with her in, taking, in talking music. Her repertoire was as extensive as the seed of Abraham. Once, when King Lot had pricked his finger on one of the needles which she used in her Cinderella part, she had sat up with him for six days and six nights and kept him awake, too, in order to nurse him back to health. This coincided with one of her incarnations as a sister of mercy, or medieval Florence Nightingale. Queen Morgoth was a witch of parts, but she was not conscious of it. She did not know that she was pursuing King Pellinore or Sir Grumor, nor had she any idea that she was making her children unhappy, and she frankly believed that there were few people as good and kind as herself. If she thought at all, it was with a side of her unknown to anatomists. She felt, and what she felt, was that she ought to be the center of the universe. The queen felt this so strongly that for a large number of people, she was. There had once been, for instance, her eye, glancing out of the window, fell upon... There had once been, for instance, her eye, glancing out of the window, fell upon the village huddled below the castle, a young fisher boy called Angus. The queen had noticed him five years before as he leaned over to have as he leaned over to heave at a seen net with which he had been netting for salmon. The salmon in the net leaped with a commotion of silver and something in the bottom muscles of the boy hauling and something in the brown muscles of the boy Holland caught the queen's eye. In a week, she had been educating him. Angus, she had explained to King Lot, was a natural gentleman. For Angus, on the stage of Angus, she had immediately acted the character studies of the drunkard's wife. She had driven King Lot to drink some time before. The lonely spirit, voyaging through strange seas of thought alone. Martha, the one who had to do all the housework. Mary, the one who did not a wayward soul, impulsive and unaccustomed to the world, the female sage, the gay spirit, the idol of society, the outcast of society, the Venus of Milo, the ugly duckling, Our Lady of Sorrows, Cleopatra, the Sister of Mercy, Sappho, Niobe, the Virgin Mary, Faustine, the practical businesswoman, Mother Love, the Spirit of Empire, Miss Lothane in Orkney, or 1470, A Maiden's Prayer, The First Rose of Summer, and The Last Rose of Summer. She had also performed, but this was only in very unguarded moments by mistake, the termagant Xantope, 
who once made Socrates' life a burden to him. Confused with these manifestations, the unfortunate Angus had ventured to caress the magic lady under the impression that she was Cleopatra when she was actually a sort of Edith Cavell, and he had been soundly slapped in the face for it. Before this, she had caused him to learn the Greek letters, six verses of French poetry, and the rudiments of hand embroidery, under the impression that these accomplishments would be useful to a fisherman. And her combination of unknown arts with unknown impersonations had led to, an, to a nervous breakdown, which was eventually terminated by the suicide of Angus. Queen Morgoth had taken the boy's death as a personal compliment and constantly referred to it in hushed tones before King Lot. Today, the queen looking out over the village where Angus had once lived did not think of him. For that matter, she did not think of King Pellinor or Sir Grumor. She only felt about them, and she realized in her feeling that, for some mysterious reason, she was not the center of their universe. This was a state of affairs which ought to be rectified. Queen Morgoth dropped her husband's letter into the fire. She had only partly read it and began to tap the stone floor of the tower room with an impatient shoe. It was a cold, dark evening, with the east wind howling outside, and in the firelit solar below the queen, King Pellinor was writing a sonnet. Sir Palamidas had explained to him that a sonnet ought to rhyme A-B-A-B-C-C-D, E-F-E-F-G-G, and the monarch had detected a solution. This was the sonnet he was writing. Dear Piggy, I hope you don't mind me calling my calling you Piggy, eh? It is very nice weather here, B. I am very well, A. Eh? I hop you are very well, B. I hop the Queen of Flanders is very well, C. I hop the dogs are very well, D. I hop the king is very well, D. I hop it is very nice weather in Flanders, C. This was all King Pellinor had succeeded in writing so far, as when he got to the beginning of of the sestet, he found that he had exhausted all his hops. It was not that he did not hop other things. He hopped that the daughter of the Queen of Flanders loved him as much as he loved her in a vague and timid way. He hopped that one day she would come to live with him and they could sleep in the same bed and do everything together ever afterwards, but he was too shy to express these hops, and he did not suppose that they would interest the daughter of the Queen of Flanders. I say, said the king, coming into the firelight, I say, Palamidas, look, I've finished the octave, or whatever you call it. Sir Palamidas examined the sonnet with a doubtful eye, holding it up to the flames. Yours truly observes no rhymes, respected royalty, said Sir Palamidas. The letters rhyme, cried the king. A rhymes with A, don't it? But the letters cannot be put in, replied the painter, axiomatically. What's axiomatically? Axiomatically is by definition. But you told me it had to go A, B, A, B. Yet A cannot rhyme with A since both are same letter. Flanders must not rhyme with Flanders. I know that, said the king sadly. Give it here. Give it here, he added in a, added he in a rising tone. Give it here, what? I can put that right in a jiffy. What, what, what? He hurried off into his dark corner and scratched out all the alternate A's, B's, and so forth. For the second B, he put P. Then he became dissatisfied with the whole poem and rewrote it more romantically as follows. Sweet, ha, daughter of Queen of Flanders, A, poor old Pelinor is thinking of you, B. Are you thinking of him, J? I wonder, P. Is it a nice day, C? You are nice, D. How nice, E. I think we shall have some rain, T. There. J rhymes with P. A, P rhymes with B, C rhymes with T. And of course, D and E are jolly good rhymes. What? You cannot put in letters at all, cried Sir Palamidas angrily. It is absolutely against spirit of the whole thing. What is the spirit? asked the king faintly. The letters stand for the rhymes. They stand for words, not letters. The letters stand for words. After this had been explained to him for a long time, King Pellinor retired once more into his corner. He was there for a long time, sighing and biting his quill pen, 
When he came out to the fire for the third time, this was the poem he had produced. It was a passionate one. Dear daughter of the Queen of Flanders, P for Piggy. Oh, how beautiful it must be to be in Flanders, just N. I yearn to see your beautiful E, I, and I do wish you would write to M. Please give my best love to the Q, also to the K. Just at present. Just at present, we are not having J, but we are very nearly caught in U. Whatever is that U? asked Sir Flanders. It's a uniform cried the king triumphantly, and Jay for jousts. The Paynim shook his head, more in sorrow than in anger. It won't do, he said, This is def thus is definitely not done. Why not, said the king, who said they stood for words. Sir Palamidas started to scream at the top of his voice. It was suddenly too much for him. Not done, not done, he began shouting, tearing King Pelinor's poem into fragments and stamping upon them. Dense, dense, this is cross, oh my, not done, God Almighty help poor Baba's DV. Nothing is understood by anybody ever. Immortal swarm of, t immortal swan of Thames, i.e. Chaucer, what sins are committed in thy name. Posy, firstborn progeny of honoured muses, Death and damnation, figuratively speaking. My head, my head, beg pardon all, excuse, precipitate, exit, ta-ta. And with these confused remarks, Sir Palamidas rushed out of the room, clutching his temples with both hands. It was not that he was an impatient man, but trying to explain to King Pellinore, after a whole morning with the lot children, had confused his brains. Besides, he had a right to be academic about poetry, since he was quite an authority on the courts of love and had himself composed a whole sonnet sequence in honor of La, Be of La Beale Island, the most impeccable of which sonnets ran as follows. Honorable madam, kind regards, immortal life be yours henceforth from 18th Ultimo. Is prayer which Palamides sings to Fife, and Tabor twice per diem. May you know ten thousand offspring, male legitimate, each one well blessed with twenty thousand wives, May each and all art achieve whate'er he strives with LSD, DV, and godly fate. May God Almighty, whom you much resemble, send cows and elephants to crowd your bed, waving their lofty trunks which swarm and tremble to shade from salt your most respected head. King Madam, Grandpa of this humble fish, Calicut failed, B.A., accept this wish. Sir Palamidas had composed these very correct sentiments in his immemorial way, common to all bards in the Arthurian century, stretched on his back in a dark room with his head wrapped in a plaid and a large cold stone on his stomach. It's this love, said Sir Grumor, stretching out his hands to the blaze in his own room. Don't you worry, old boy, it's only love. But he can't rhyme! cried Sir Palamidas. Uh, but he can't rhyme, cried Palamidas, who had come to him to, for comfort. Oh, goodness gracious, dear sir, he can't rhyme. Doesn't matter, said Sir Grumor. Just you leave him alone and he'll scribble out something, no doubt. He keeps writing A, B, A, B. Very good thing to write. Let him stick to the alphabet and he can't come much to much harm. We may be sure. Never was much good at writing myself. But, sir, but, sir, it is all A-B-A-B, -A -B, or if not, it is A-D-K-C. What good can come of this? It ain't so much the good, said Sir Grumor sensibly. It's what keeps him quiet. Yet the noble science, the muses. What can, pe what can Pendragon Empire do when bards are so defunct sensibility? Bother the Pendragon Empire. Sir Grumor! Yes, Palamedes. Baba, the Pendragon Empire. The Paynim stared at Sir Grumor for a minute's long dismay. Radical! he exclaimed at last. But hang it, Palamedes, I'm not a radical just because I don't bother about rhyming. Knew a fellow once who couldn't write his own name. Far less rhyme it. And he was the staunchest conservative of them all. Nonetheless, you bothered the Empire. Now it was Sir Grumor's turn to lose his temper. Oh, drat and dang it all, he shouted. What with love and politics and carnations, a fellow doesn't know where he is from one moment to the next. What is all this about A.B. anyway? <coughs> <coughs> Excuse 
excuse me. It is poetry, said the Saracen with dignity. Poetry? Love poetry? Ah, said Sir Grumore, putting his fingers to his nose in the way he had. When we come to love, that's quite a different matter. Sir Palamides made a kind of grunt. Love, said Sir Grumore. Ah, yes, hmm. that's a queer do, that it is. Love, said Sir Palamides with dignity, causes the sphere to perform revolutions by Jingo. The two knights considered the phenomenon for a moment in silence, their faces lit from below by the flames. I was in love once, said Sir Grumore eventually. I married her, however. King Pelinor discovered that when they had been discussing the subject for some time, King Pelinor discovered them when they had been discussing the subject for some time. I say, Palamides, he exclaimed, bouncing in, I say, do you think you might have torn up my sonnet? It has something. It had something written on the back. What was written on the back? Where my address was. Now I don't know where I am. But you're here, old boy. We've had all this out before. That's Grumore that said that. But you're here, old boy. We've had all this out before. I know I'm here, Grumore. Whatever do you take me for, dear chap? But it's such a long address, I thought I'd write it down. All this Lothane and Orkney. We can't be in both places at once, can we? And I thought I'd write it down so I could send it to Flanders. Well, we'll write it down another time. Clearly? asked the king. In capital letters. Good, said the king with satisfaction. Then we shall know where we are, won't we, what? We certainly shall. After all, considered the king, it helps to know. And he fell into a reverie, staring into the fire. Apropos of love, remarked the king later on, darkly. Have you noticed anything? I say, don't you know, eh? I beg your pardon. Noticed anything, Pelinor? About you know who, explained the king, blushing. Who? Oh, come on, Grumore. I mean to say. Now, Pelinor, you say what you mean to say as clearly as you can. Think it out first, and then say it as you mean. Pronounce your vowels, added Sir Palamides. But really, Grumore, you know who I mean. Whom, said Sir Palamides. Well, then, her. Her? Uh, she hasn't been rolling off to you or anything like that. Some of the worst part of King Pelinor's cliff walk with the witch when they had first arrived had been what they had, had been when they had laid down for a chat and the witch had begun rolling towards him. King Pelinor had tried to roll away surreptitiously and they had covered about 30 yards. Who is this rolling woman? asked Sir Grumor in exasperation. Is it the Queen of Flanders' daughter? Or that Ares girl, or who? Is it a sort of guessing game? She begins with an M, said the king. Mary, King Pelinor was disgusted. Mary, he exclaimed. Who ever heard of anybody called Mary? It's a common name, said Sir Grumor defensively. Of course it's a common name, but I mean M. M, 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 added Pelinor, waving his arms and beginning to shout. His shadow made strange gestures on the ceiling. Melchizedek, suggested Sir Palamides for reasons best known to himself. King Pelinor sat down and put his head in his hands. Oh, I say, you two, he said weakly. Whatever are you talking about? It's this guessing game, said Sir Grumor. This woman who rolls. Well, then, have you noticed anything about her? But we don't know who she is, old boy. It's M, said the king. You know her. The what you may call it, and he made sundry gestures as if, as if jerking his thumb over his shoulder, rolling his eyes toward the room above, pursing up his lips, nodding his head, and winking repeatedly. He means the queen, said Sir Palamides. King Pelinor was delighted. That's it, he exclaimed, jumping up and down and snapping his fingers. That's her. That's the one I mean, but I didn't say it. I didn't mention any names. I didn't talk any scandal. I kept the vows of my knighthood, didn't I, what? No nomenclature, said Sir Palamides solemnly. No, ex no exercises with packs. But what is all this? asked Sir Grumor. Has Queen Morgoth been rolling? Where did she begin? I only asked, said the king with dignity. 
whether you had noticed anything with you-know-who apropos of love. Is there anything to notice? King Pellinor and King and Sir Palamidas exchanged a look. Naturally, the Paynim was not entirely in ignorance of the Queen's character, after having been tutored to her family for so long. I only asked, said King Pellinor eventually. Sir Grumor put on a wise look and began to nod his head. The Queen's in love, he said. That's it. Now I see everything clearly. She's in love with the gardener, I suppose, and that's why she talks about carnations all the time. And no doubt she has been helping him to roll the bowling green. It's very cold, but but it's cold weather for gardening, added Sir Grumor thoughtfully. And that's the end of chapter 14.